They're two of Orange County's most popular yet controversial politicians, and they can't stand each other. Incumbent DA Tony Rakakis and Supervisor Todd Spitzer are firing volleys as they get ready to run for the DA's office next year. What's behind the bad blood and what could it mean for the sheriff? And these are troubled times for public schools, including in Anaheim, where parents are protesting new rules about what schools their kids can go to. Well, to analyze these issues, Voice of OC's Noberto Santana and California Policy Center's Will Swain. They're next on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by... Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live. They are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Memorial Care is transforming the way healthcare is delivered, keeping our communities and businesses healthy by guiding them on the path to wellness with easily accessible hospitals, physician offices, and outpatient centers. Memorial Care, leading the way. Hi, I'm Rick Reef, and I'm talking with Noberto Santana and Will Swaim. Gentlemen, a lot to cover, but first, I want to thank both of you because I recently recorded the 500th edition of, uh, thank you, thank you, you said congratulations, uh, the 500th edition of this show, and Will, you are now on for the 72nd time over the, over the 10 plus years. You have been on more than anyone. And, Noberta, you're not chopped liver yourself. You've been on over 20 times. I want to thank both of you for, for all the times that you have come on to share your uh, perspectives, your personality, your good looks, and everything else. Okay. Thanks for having us. 72 times once a year. That's, That's right. why I look like this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's... Uh, there, uh, there's a lot going on right now in our law enforcement. And we've got this contention between these two politicians uh, uh, and it's all against this backdrop of this uh, 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 snitch controversy, the snitch scandal, if you will, in the jails. Uh, Noberto, set it all up for us. What's going on here? You know, in general, a few years ago, uh, Scott DeCry, you know, goes in and, and, and becomes a serial killer in a, in a hair salon. When this guy goes up for trial, his public defender starts talking to him and it turns out that they had a snitch, an informant in his cell. Now, ironically, I don't know why you would need an informant for a guy who walked in to a hair salon and shot everybody and basically... Well, of course, in fairness, admitted. I think what they've said is the informant testimony is valuable because, because they were afraid he was going to declare insanity, so this would help to get a, uh, uh, a death sentence on him. I think, in fairness, that's yeah, why they do it. Yeah, but that's yeah. the answer to the question, as you say, why in the world do you need an informant where, in a case where it was... Uh, you know, shut and it was, uh, you know, closed. closed but I think, case. just a quick question for you, because I think that for most of us who get our, uh, our, our criminal uh, information, our, our education about criminality and justice, uh, we understand that the, the cops do this all the time. Aren't they supposed to put informants in people's prisons? Well, no, they're not supposed to. People's jails. Uh, uh, right. Uh, I mean, informants work in law enforcement, but there's also a concept that when, you know, you are jailed, you know, you have been accused of a crime, the, the government's job is to hold you, right? And to let, and all the information that the government has about you and your case has to be shared with your defense attorney to ensure that you have the best trial. What happened here is, early on, Scott Sanders, his uh, public defender, went in, heard about this, started asking questions about, well, wait a minute, how many informants do you have? How do you use them? Uh, how did you select it? Why did you talk to my guy? Why didn't I know about this until I came to court? So all of a sudden now, the authorities that be say, there is no informants. We don't use any of this stuff. Lo and behold, through a public records request, Mr. Sanders comes out finding this tread, a database that has names of informants, cells that they're in, moving things around. After a few months, now I think we're up to six different cases that have been complicated. People like murderers are being let off because what has happened is the prosecution and the sheriff deputies, and we don't exactly know how or why, they weren't sharing any of this information that they were supposed to be sharing with the other side. It's like saying, let's have a fair fight. You know, I need the information so I can defend my client. They were systematically doing these operations and then withholding the evidence from defense attorneys. And again, now that this has become to, to come out, uh, you know, it's fallen all over the place. Well, and in fact, it's a case that seems to just keep 
ratcheting up and the more denials that are made because the the DA and the sheriff have both denied that there was this systematic uh, system of wrongdoing if you will uh, you know now you've got a federal probe uh, the DA has been taken off the case and the state attorney general is in to uh, uh, prosecute uh, the decry, uh, de decry, decry case and uh, 60 minutes has done, uh, uh, you know, a, a big expose. National TV, congratulations. You know, you're not. And on that show, the DA Tony Rakakis flat out said there is no informant program. Right. Yet there's a database that tracks it for years. Um, one that they didn't want to give up at first called Tread, uh, that lists names of enforcement. There's one uh, 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 jail. I believe it's a captain uh, that was testified that literally went into detail about how, yeah, we used informants, maybe it got out of hand. You know, these types of programs always is the type of thing that we have informants, and I think sometimes the sheriff and the DA are using semantics here a little bit. They're saying, we use informants, but we don't have really a program where right. we uh, selectively put them so into place. This is, a, this is something of a conspiracy. We've got two separate law enforcement offices that have to be involved. If this thing exists, and it sure seems to, right. you have to have these two offices, the DA's office and the sheriff's office. You've got the DA now running for re-election next year against Todd Spitzer. You've got the sheriff who's uh, almost, what, half-million-dollar uh, pensions on the line. Uh, well, I don't think they're on the line. No, I, nobody's but, pension's ever on the line. This is part of the problem, but, right. but I prescind. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you, you've got these two major players, and they're either, like, nobody's throwing anybody else under the bus. Super, I mean, so far, as I right. can yeah. tell, right. uh, the, sh the sheriff is saying I, there is no system. The DA is saying there is no system. We've got the unions now stepping in to protect their members and say that our guys don't know anything, and if they do know anything, it's because the supervisors, the managers, put them in this precarious position. Uh, I just well, don't... that's where I think things are starting to hit the fan, Noberto. And as we speak, there uh, there's testimony being revealed. In fact, as we speak, or, or it's very possible that before this show airs, the sheriff herself will have been called before a judge to answer some questions about this this system. So this is, uh, this is a moving target right now. Right. But suddenly, this is what caught my attention, where all of these deputies are going up, and they're all taking the fifth. Never good. Ne never a good sign. They're right. all taking the fifth. And now you've got a couple supervisors who, uh, when I say supervisors, not county supervisors, but jail supervisors, the managers of these guys, who are uh, suddenly they're testifying and well they're kind of acknowledging I guess there was a system we didn't know about it we left it to these deputies and suddenly you got this idea of rogue deputies you've got the union suggesting no it's bad supervision and suddenly I think um, as Will suggests you might have some people turning flipping whatever and it's it's getting pretty sticky absolutely and as you said it gets deeper and deeper how do you again I go back to you know, investigative reporting always is on the basics right if it doesn't exist and you don't have an informant system, how can you have a database tracking them? I mean, you know, the judge in this case is so frustrated that he has compelled the sheriff to come back because they're still waiting for boxes of documents. They've asked for documents. All of a sudden they show up one day and it shows more information. And again, keep in mind, you already have at least a half dozen cases where the district attorney has been forced to just plead them out because it's complicated about the informants. And remember, informants are the kind of people, we found this out in the Iraq war, right? They lie, they get paid money. Taxpayers have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to informants for information to get other people you know, in jail. But at some point, as you said, it's starting to turn into this big morass of sort of like, what did you do? And again, the story that seems to be coming from the DA and the sheriff is just, these are rogue deputies who came up with a database on their own and tracked moved informants well, back and yeah. forth on cases, all doing it by themselves. Yeah, so Will, against this backdrop, that's about all we can say right now about this. It's a mess and it's ongoing and we're going to learn more almost every day about uh, you know, what was going on in the jail there. So this is the backdrop for, one, uh, for a really huge political confrontation this coming year between Todd Spitzer, the supervisor, and Tony Rakakis, the DA. Uh, what's this all about? When you say it, I'm reminded of the great quote during the uh, Trump and Clinton campaign that you had your, you had two choices, uh, stabbing and poison. Uh, I, this is really bad because you've got a DA's office that is set up to just be knocked down. I don't understand how Tony can even run again with a straight face. The guy's just on national television saying he didn't know what was going on. Reminds me of Jack Nicholson in uh, what's the movie where he's in Cuba and 
you can't handle the truth. Um, this is a, a, few good men, a few good men. A few good men. We got, we got two good men here. Yes. <laughs> so you can't. Uh, the, what's, Tony doesn't know what's going on under his own roof, apparently. I, I mean, that seems to be the argument that he didn't know this was going on, even though his prosecutors so are getting information. So this is good for Todd Spitzer. And of course, that's part of what Todd's talking about it is that this seem. jail scandal is the reason we need a new prosecutor. And so it would seem if Todd didn't do things, I was going to say go off like, you know, half cocked, except that. He did go off half cocked, literally. I think you know the story better than I do, but uh, right. maybe you can. Uh, uh, in the Wahoos restaurant with right. the. Uh, uh, is, uh, yeah, right. just tell the story. A so. county supervisor, this is Todd Spitzer, who has an evangelist come up to him and say, Let's talk about God. On Good Friday, after he's walked the Stations of the Cross, Mr. Spitzer becomes agitated, walks outside, calls police officers two times to come into this diner and take care of this man, goes back in himself when the deputies don't show up within a few minutes, and handcuffs the evangelist himself, saying that he was worried about the safety of the entire diner because this evangelist looked at him and a butter knife or a knife in a weird kind of way. So, I mean, odd judgment. At Very best. weird, yeah. So, so you have on one hand, you have uh, Tony, and there's been some issues now uh, because of the jail scandal and other things about his, let's say, his credibility and his, and his capabilities. Mm -hmm. With Todd, doesn't it become a matter not just of this incident, but some other things that have happened, uh, a kind of temperament, judgment. I mean, his, uh, uh, for many years, his nickname has been, you know, Todd Ready, Fire, Aim. Uh, but a popular guy, and, uh, you know, a lot of people really have high regard for, for Todd Spitzer, a guy who gets things done, who isn't afraid to take a stand. But some people are thinking, wow, is it, as a DA, is this the temperament you want? Well, and, and Tony Rakakis has a resume that includes uh, arrests and prosecutions of people who later turned out to be completely innocent and should have been exonerated. And then he would hold, after acknowledging that the evidence wasn't there to convict them in the first place, he would basically hold them ransom until they signed away their rights to sue him. Uh, this is the kind of thing that happens in California and the United States routinely where law enforcement goes way outside the lines, does something terribly wrong, and they never pay for it literally because the taxpayers pick up the tab. Millions of dollars in some of these settlements that you know the taxpayers have to pay off. Yeah, on, on the temperament scale, though, if you're going to say where does Tony, uh, if you're going to do a tale of the tape here, uh, Tony's temperament, I think most people would grade him higher than than Todd. Would 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 either of you disagree with yeah, that? Yeah, no, that would be his that would be his advantage. I, I that's guess disgusting. That's yeah. that, that really literally does seem to me like stabbing over poison. I, I just yeah. there's there's a third person who is rumored yeah. So let's to be talk about that because yeah. now some people are suggesting somewhere, and I mean in the legal community, there's a lot of talk. We got to come up with a with another candidate here. We need somebody else. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about that. Well, there was a, a former John Morlock chief of staff, now Chapman University professor Mario Moreno, uh, Monero, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, and super bright guy, very well connected, uh, and I think would bring a kind of um, less political sort of a, approach to this. I, certainly appealing to me, uh, very much more of a kind of a, a free market, libertarian-ish kind of, uh, but and yet conservative approach to law enforcement. I mean, I think he's much more... He, he coincides much more with Orange County's temperament. You'd get by the book with Mario, super by the book. The question is, does Orange County's elites want by the book? Because in some ways, I've always thought with Tony Rakakis, you know, we are getting what, what we want. I mean, the, the political elites of Orange County have made a calculated move that they, you know, in a sense, want a political cop on Valium. You know, and I guess, you know, it's either Valium or Lithium or, you know, in your two choices. But, uh, uh, <laughs> But Mario Monero is a very uh, a credible, when he was a chief of staff to uh, John Morlock, look, one of the jail scandals that happened, happened because of, or was uncovered because of Mario Monero. Because the morning that they found out that there had been a jailhouse beating, uh, uh, Derek Chamberlain, John Derek Chamberlain at the jails, the very first thing that Mario Monero did was what no other politician would do, is run to the site immediately and start seeing. And when he saw them taking TVs out of booths, he started asking questions. And by being on the scene immediately, almost sort of not knowing any better, just went and did the right thing, that scandal actually moved somewhere. It moved to a scale of accountability because there was somebody there who basically called balls and strikes right away with no attention to where it would go. And it certainly went very, very far. You may need a prosecutor like that. The question is, does Orange County's Republican and Democratic establishment 
want to prosecute well, like that. Well, you know, that. the Republican establishment, at least up till now, and I'm not sure it will change, has been very solid for uh, for Tony. And even even folks who like Todd is saying, you know, we've got, you know how parties work. He's an incumbent, popular vote getter. And, and let me just throw out the point that, you know, uh, this jailhouse scandal may get journalists excited and civil, civil libertarians uh, 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 perplexed. But the average citizen at the end of the day says, so what really went on here? They, uh, what if they overreached with informants? Not good, not good, and, and you know, and perhaps illegal. But, um, you know, they're going after bad guys. So they overreached going after bad guys. Are you going to vote a guy out of office for that? I guess it depends on if the script becomes, by overreaching for bad guys in a sloppy manner, you let a lot of bad guys go free. If yeah. that becomes the narrative, then you have maybe issues. And but that you claim ignorance of something going on right underneath your nose. Like this sure. is in his office, sure. and he is saying it does not exist. Well, when you say he, t Tony's the prosecutor. This right. again is where we talk about the sheriff. And let's talk a little bit about our sheriff, sure. uh, Sandra Hutchins. Very popular, cool customer. In fact, Noberto, you just wrote a, a column. Uh, I bet Orange County Sheriff Sandra Hutchins is one badass poker player, and you can explain <laughs> that in a moment. Sure. But you know, so um, you know, in a way, that it's her. It's not Tony's jail. It's her jail. So, so talk about what's going on with Sandra Hutchins. Well, she's finally getting dragged into this debate, as you said. So far, it's been this you know fist fight between Todd Spitzer and the DA. But at some point, says like, wait a minute, the prosecutor is not the person that manages this jail. It's the sheriff. And so more and more now. She's being dragged into it. She's being sued by the Association of Orange County Deputy Sheriffs, by the uh, special officers that she has. At the same time, there, today, this morning, there is a grand jury report coming out on this snitch scandal. Uh, more and more, she's being dragged into it. Now, the thing with Sandra Hutchins, which is, I wrote, two public sector pensions, one from LA and one from Orange County, that gives you a lot of peace and tranquility. I mean, you can call them as you want. She is one cool player. I mean, I, I saw her in a week of, of trials with lawyers, you know, hours after hour after hour on stand. And she, like in, a, said, in a union dispute, right? Union like we don't dispute, have, but we don't get into the hour uh, details. Hour after hour yeah. being pounded with questions again and again and again. And she just sat there and like, that's why I just said, that is one badass poker player. I bet she would be good because she just sat there, smiled, no problem. I don't know. I don't recall. That's a great answer, you know, that works in trials. I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. But nonetheless, she was unflappable. I mean, she really didn't get off of her. I walked her back from that trial to her office about six different blocks. And I mean, I asked every single way you could a question, right? And she didn't get irritated, she didn't get nothing, but she didn't answer nothing. And so I, that's what I said. She's <laughs> gonna get dragged into this thing, but trying to get answers out of her, good luck. Well, we'll see if the judge uh, who's going to be questioning her soon will have any, uh, what, what will come of that. But uh, she, she is a person, when you talk to her, it's like her, uh, she's a very credible person. And you don't walk away thinking, uh, I don't trust her. It seems like she's a straight shooter. And, she, and she's been on this show, you know, uh, and she's, you know, very open and uh, accessible and all that. So it'll be interesting. Um, let's go back. One thing you've been involved in, we've talked about Todd Spitzer. You've had that lawsuit. Uh, explain it very briefly and, sure. and what's happening with that. When that incident happened at Wahoo's, sometime after that, Mr. Spitzer wrote an op-ed describing his actions. And again, to us as reporters, we thought, let's take a look at that op-ed. There was this argument that they said, well, no, it was sent through the government uh, email system and thus it's a secret document. We challenged that, we went to court, and we won on that argument. We're waiting right now, the judge's order is being finalized. Soon we will have that op-ed written in Todd Spitzer's own hand, explaining his actions, and I think in some ways it's the most sort of uh, telling document that will tell us, as you said earlier, will allow us to judge his judgment, right? You'll well, see his exchanges with the public information officer of the county, and of course, part of Todd's uh, explanation was that you are Svengali. Right. You made Todd Spitzer uh, uh, do whatever he did with, with, the news, with the Orange County Register and everything else. Right, I challenged him in an interview, and this is probably to me the saddest thing about this entire affair was when they attempted to put me on a stand, they attempted to depose a journalist to go right after the California Shield Law for reporters. And this has gotta be the scariest thing of Mr. Spitzer as a prosecutor. This is what most people in town are afraid of, is that when you are in a confrontation with him, that he will seek to use the law as a weapon, not as what it's intended to. We won that motion very easily, and it was a, a laughable attempt 
by the county's part and Mr. Uh, and Supervisor Spitzer's to intimidate the press corps, to go after. In 30 years, I've never had anybody try to depose a reporter. It's ridiculous. And yet, they lost on that. But it certainly said a lot about the mentality there, about that sort of win-at-all-cost mentality that, ironically, the district attorney himself has been criticized on. Yeah. Also, let's just talk briefly uh, about the jail escape. That's one other issue that Sandra Hutchins has had to deal with as the sheriff. We had that sensational escape. And I got to tell you, Will, one of the things that strikes me on these things, you know, the grand jury uh, had a report on it. And, uh, you know, it looks to me like it was a breakdown. The facility itself has some issues. Of course, you always blame the building. It's the building's fault. Yep. And uh, the supervision was bad. There were individual deputies. What in the world are they doing? You know, and and again, you know, the the deputies union wants to say it's it's lousy supervision. When you have something like that, it is lousy supervision. But can a deputy, you know, count do a bed check? You know, I mean, it just seems like there's a failure at at every level, and yet no heads ever roll. Nope. Nobody lose their job. Uh, you know, uh, and people that get in trouble retire, get their pensions. And then the public at some point pays millions of dollars. Well, that's right. And I think, you know, part of this is, uh, I, I don't remember who said it, but uh, we get the government we deserve. And that's because, you know, most people just simply don't care. We don't care about the county. It's this inscrutable thing. We but don't care about school boards. But people want to live their lives. I mean, yes, to they what extent that's do right. are people, don't, don't you elect people to do the job because you're trying to raise a family, do a no, job? No, the, the fact is most of us don't elect somebody. Most of us don't vote. You know, I mean, most of us just stay home. We're chilling and watching Netflix. Am I right? And so we've got this actual live House of Cards uh, series going on with, with prison breaks and pr jailhouse snitches and, a, you know, I think, I would argue, a corrupt DA, a sheriff who I think is in hot water, and a union that protects its members who make 250000 to 300000 bucks a year and retire at about that same rate of pay after 30 years of service in their early 50s. And nobody wants to take responsibility. So meanwhile, the people who are making, you know, an average of thirty-five or forty thousand bucks a year are supposed to take responsibility and pay that guy's paycheck, and he can't do a bed check. Forget it. Yeah, it, we, I, I, we we have earned the democracy. I, sh I should say we've said some pretty tough things about Todd Spitzer and Tony Rakakis. Not quite as tough about Sandra Hudgens, but uh, uh, Tony and Todd both have standing invitations for me to come on this show. And, and years ago, Tony was on, uh, Todd's been on a couple times, uh, always been a good interview, but in recent years, neither one of them is, is, is checking in. But I just wanted to get that on the record, that they, they, are, they have an open invite. They can, they can come on and let it rip whenever they want. So Will, uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Uh, I, I referenced this education issue in Anaheim that you've been following. What's that about? Well, there's a couple of interesting things. One is, is there's, you know, ba the background here is a financial crisis in school districts. There are employee pay and compensation, retirement benefits, post-retirement benefits like health care. These things are skyrocketing. So districts are trying to save all the money they can so they can afford to keep funding pensions, for example, or teacher pay at the highest levels. And one of the places they've decided they're going to save some money is the, the students who try to leave their district. State funding follows the student in California. So if a student leaves Anaheim and goes to, let's say, Orange to go to school, the district loses in Anaheim. They lose about 10,000 bucks. That's a lot of money if you have hundreds and hundreds of students leaving. So Anaheim did what any wise person would do. They just blocked the exits. They said, students can't leave anymore. So they had, I don't know, uh, six or 700 uh, people apply to get their kids out of Anaheim last year. More than 65% of them were denied the, the, uh, the opportunity to leave and go someplace else. Some of these people appealed to the, count, to the county, which is their right, and then the district dropped all, ob all obligations to defend itself in that case and said, oh, you know, we're not gonna fight these appeals anymore. But the bottom line is Anaheim is a failing public school district in almost every respect. You've got 80% of the kids can't read or do math at grade, uh, grade level. And this is their response to people who might be seeking to go elsewhere to get an education is to block the schoolhouse door in the kind of reverse, not letting black people in, but not letting mostly Latino people out. Yeah, so uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh you know, the, 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 the most challenging thing of school districts these days is trying to follow the budgets. You know, we were talking yeah. about this before, is that you sit back and you're trying to see where there's a lot of resources being aimed at, at school districts. And the big question for all of us as reporters, parents, students, is where does it go? You know, where are you spending it? And 
frankly, I mean, this is the big frustration of our day. I have never seen something as Byzantium as a school district budget. I'm stunned yeah. that you guys are able to go through it because it is, and to watch parents sometimes in the uh, uh, you know audiences of a school board meeting trying to figure out things like LCAP, uh, you know, the, yeah. where these monies are going, it's super challenging. Yeah. I question a lot of administrator pay, mm. uh, perks, yep. benefits. I mean, frankly, while teacher pay is out there, it's one of the, the, again, I have yet to see a really good schematic of school budgets. And I think it's one of the biggest challenges of our time. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, and I think very telling that the school district dropped it. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and again, you know, gotta, is it there, are we here to serve a school district or serve kids that want to get educated? That is so. the question we should talk another time. And that's it for now. Thanks again to my guests, Noberto Santana and Will Swaim. You can watch this show and past shows at pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter. We'll be chattering here. And follow us on, on YouTube and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live, they are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University in the City of Orange. Chapman University is a proud sponsor of Inside OC and community programming.